from MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. I'm John Shearer in Mammoth in Yellowstone National Park, and coming up, I'll explain why the Mammoth Hotel here is not able to take guests this winter. After the murders, I went as far as to put a stun gun under my bed, actually, and we always lock the door and deadbolt it if possible. A new look at College Town Safety, how student life in Bozeman has changed since the grisly murders at the University of Idaho. Meantime, it is 6.30. Chet Lehman, Matt Elwell with you here. A dark and dark morning Yeah, Montana State University. It Canada. is. A little bit of cloud cover. Temperatures mm -hmm. have been uh, chilly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hard to tell. We had some <laughs> temperatures go out. So, uh, around 10 degrees this morning uh, in the Bozeman area mm -hmm. and out toward Butte. Uh, mainly cloudy conditions. But our temperatures through the afternoon uh, are going to be pretty steadily into the 20s. Uh, there are some snow chances. Doesn't look dramatic. You look at the uh, temperatures for today. The profile pushing upper 20s for most of the area under mostly cloudy skies. Pleasant, but we do have more sunshine on the way. We're going to talk about the timing of our next snow potential for the weekend. That's coming up in just a few minutes. All right, thank you, Matt. 631 now. When massive flooding last June wiped out roads in the northern part of Yellowstone National Park, it also wiped out the summer business prospect for hotels, restaurants, tour guides, and more in the Gateway community of Gardner. Those roads reopened this winter, so MTN's John Shear is in Gardner this morning live, checking out how businesses are rebounding. Good morning, John. Good morning, Chet. Uh, holding at about 19 degrees here, but just in the last oh, 15 minutes or so, a little breeze has picked up and making it feel kind of brisk here in Gardner. Many guides and other business owners I spoke with during the past week tell me that they can sum up the first month of the winter tourism season in just one word, slow. They talked to me about why they think that might be happening. It's definitely been a, been a slow, uh, kind of rough winter. Business is a little light. The holidays were uh, less busy. Our winter bookings are down by about 40%. We have a lot of wildlife in the Mammoth area this winter. I think part of it's because there's just not as many people around. That's not great news for these Gardner business people. They need a robust winter to recoup the losses from last summer when flooding closed access to the park from their communities. Everybody's done a really good job of being flexible and rolling with this because there's no, I've said there's no playbook to, to what, what's happened here. Because the wastewater system could not be repaired in time for the winter, the Mammoth Hotel behind me here is not taking guests this season. The first time that's happened in a long time. It's bad news for Zantera, the company that runs this hotel, but not so bad news for hotels down in Gardner. Well, surprisingly well, uh, especially since Mammoth Hotel didn't open up, so that helps funnel a lot of the business down to us. So we're having as good of a winter as we can. And guides do have some hope for the rest of the winter. We're starting to see things pick up a little bit um, through the rest of January and February, and we have a few bookings when, in March. So why are people not flooding back to the park now that this new road is open and access is easy? This year, a lot of people were really confused about whether or not the road had reopened to the general public. I think people are sort of starting to understand that. I think there's still a little confusion from some people, but um, yeah, the road is, is open. It's been open all winter. Everybody got inundated with the news of the flood, the images of the roads washed away, but that same kind of attention has not been given to the creation of the new road. But everyone is optimistic for the coming summer. Advanced reservations for next summer are excellent. You know, we, we have strong interest in Yellowstone again. We expect visitation to be normal. Next summer, our bookings are actually up a little bit from what they were this time last year. The power of Yellowstone to draw people uh, hasn't dissipated. I'm expecting it to be back to normal and, um, you know, hopefully gangbusters come, come July and June. And um, I, I hope that businesses are, are surprised. Now, the winter season runs until mid-March. Uh, park Superintendent Cam Shawley tells me that the park is fully open for winter operations all across the northern and southern parts. Um, Kara McGarry, who you also heard from there, tells me that winter snow conditions are stellar this year, better than they have been in quite a while. She says people who aren't coming out are missing out on something. Chet? 
All right, again, MTN's uh, John Shearer live this morning in Gardner. You can listen to our complete conversation with these business owners anytime by visiting our website. Other news this morning, newly unsealed court documents outline what investigators found while searching accused uh, University of Idaho killer Brian Koberger's apartment following his arrest. 49-page document explains that investigators had probable cause to believe Koberger committed the murders of four U of I students in November of last year. Investigators seized a computer, several hairs, and items that appeared to have been dark red-brown stains. Koberger's apartment near Washington State University, just 10 miles from the home where the murders took place in Idaho. According to a leaked source, Koberger allegedly direct messaged one of the four victims repeatedly on Instagram. Now, a tragedy like this sparks a lot of concern for college students around the country. MTN's Kristen Merkel spoke with MSU students on Wednesday as they returned to campus for the second semester. The murder of four University of Idaho students has struck the nation. These four students were doing what many other college students do, like leaving a fraternity house or a local bar, and now college students all across the country are second-guessing their safety. I live with four other girls, and so the situation just feels super similar, which is pretty eerie. Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin were all murdered in an off-campus home in Moscow, Idaho on November 13th. Kaylee and Madison were at a local bar while Zana and Ethan were at Ethan's fraternity house before heading home. 28-year-old Brian Koberger was taken into custody on December 30th, charged with four counts of first-degree murder. MSU students say this case has definitely made them take more precautions. After the murders, I went as far as to put a stun gun under my bed, actually, and we always lock the door and deadbolt it if possible. You know, I always walk with a group or like never yeah. go alone when it's dark outside and stuff like that. And then like I always have my pepper spray on. Recent reports say Koberger was messaging one of the victims on Instagram. This sparked concern over social media safety with local college students. I think I've always been kind of conscientious because my mom always talks about like don't post too many like personal things, yeah. but it definitely makes you consider it more. Bozeman Police Patrol Captain Joe Swanson says there are certain safety measures you should take to help prevent a tragedy like this from occurring. Always be aware of your surroundings, maintain a relationship with your neighbors so you have a contact close to you, lock your doors, ensure your outside lighting works, make sure outdoor ring doorbells and cameras work, and if there's anything suspicious going on, don't hesitate to call the police. Students like Lauren are now keeping a closer eye out as MSU spring semester begins. I live in like a fairly safe spot, but like even like knowing that that happened in a house, which I feel like was pretty safe, it's definitely making me a little more aware. In Bozeman, Kristen Merkel, MTN News. All right, thank you, Kristen, very much. 638 now. People who oppose abortion, including many from our state, are gathering in Washington for this year's annual March for Life on Friday. For 50 years, the march has been scheduled on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. However, with the Supreme Court overturning Roe last year, we were curious, what's the purpose of the march now? Our Joe St. George with a closer look and the latest fight over abortion rights. Marches down the middle of the street happen all the time in Washington. There are small marches around the Capitol over immigration. There are big marches like the Progressive Women's March back in 2017. Conservative marches like the Tea Party March on Washington back in 2009. Many marches come and go, but one march has happened every year since 1974. Anti-abortion march known as the March for Life. For years, it was all about overturning Roe v. Wade. Roe may be overturned. It's just different now. Meet Mark Harrington, an opponent of abortion and an activist who will be among the thousands marching Friday in Washington. He says the reason happening is because the Supreme Court last year didn't end the debate over abortion. They just evolved it. This year's march won't be going to the Supreme Court like previous years. Instead, it's heading to the Capitol, where it's unclear how Congress will handle this issue in the years to come. Will Democrats prevail and get Roe v. Wade protections enshrined into federal law? 
or will conservatives win with new abortion restrictions? There still is a federal aspect to this. The reality, though, is the abortion fight over the next few years is more likely to play out in the deserts of Arizona or the beaches of Florida than on the National Mall, with state legislatures and state Supreme Courts already modifying and clarifying laws. Harrington says opponents of abortion like him will use this week's march to rally supporters, including faith leaders, to help defeat expected ballot measures. Last year, his side lost elections in conservative states like Kansas and Montana. We're going to have to fight back and defeat these ballot measures. For supporters of abortion rights, it's a challenging week. This week's march is always tough to watch. Jamie Manson is the president of Catholics for Choice. She helps people realize just how damaging the Supreme Court opinion has been for so many women. 13 states now ban most abortions. Enormous suffering, uh, especially for, for women, children, families who are already suffering for other injustices. Manson had hoped the march would evolve this year and focus on life issues beyond the topic of abortion. Her message to faith leaders attending, remember many of the people in your pews support abortion rights. Pope Francis himself has said abortion is an important issue, but it is not the only issue. Joe St. George, Scripps News, Washington.